Good morning, everyone. This is exciting. So far, this is what I'm noticing. I'm, I'm liking this a lot. Uh, there's only one thing I don't like. Um, now, I love you guys, but these people over here are out of my peripherals. I love you, but I don't trust you, if you know what I mean. Don't be throwing stuff. All right, Billy? Well, I'm glad that you guys are here with us this morning. This is, this is really exciting. I kind of like this. Get to see everybody. Um, there is coffee and donuts back there. That's exciting, too. Praise God for that. Uh, would you guys stand as we start our service together? Terry, are you going to talk to us this whole time? Nothing. Someone come get her. Security? Matt says no. <laughs> Lord be with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thanks for getting the family together. It may be a different room, but it's still the same church, and I'm just so grateful for that. I pray that as we lift up a, a shout of praise or we lift a song to you this morning, that it, it fills our hearts and we're able to just give it right back to you, and we're thankful for what you've done for us this week. God, just be with us. Be with our message today. Let us be challenged and, and give us a goal for the day and for the week as we enter back into the world and we can share your love with others. We thank you, Lord. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing the Lord's Prayer together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Again. Father, let your kingdom come. Not to break my neck. Here we go. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
Welcome to Tolsburg Christian Church. Uh, I've got a few announcements for you guys. Uh, as in a few, I mean a lot. Uh, so this Tuesday, uh, our youth group is having a fundraiser meal. We are serving food at the Farm Bureau Talent Show again this year. So kids, make sure you're here, 6th through 12th grade youth group. Make sure you wear your Tolsboro shirts. And parents, if I've talked to you about desserts, just a reminder about that as well. So that's this Tuesday. Uh, the meal will be at 6 o'clock. Uh, let's see. Trunk or treat is Thursday. We are going to be in here in the gym. We'll have tables set up for you guys to decorate. Uh, we're still taking candy if you would like to donate that. Um, and we are also serving hot dogs and kids that go to Tolsboro. We are having a costume contest. So make sure you wear your costumes on Thursday. Uh, next one is the Election Day Prayer Vigil on November 5th. Uh, if you would like to sign up, uh, the sign-up sheet is out there on the table, or you can talk to Mary Corns about that. Uh, whether the carpet's done, I don't know. Um, it'll be in here or over there, but it's going to be here. So either way at Tolsboro. A Night to Remember. Uh, at KCU. Uh, guest speaker is Alan Robertson. Uh, if you would like to sign up for that, you can see me or Rex or Jake, and it's $50. Um, I don't know if Jake has, has any more spots at his table, because he's very popular, but we can still sign you up. Craft Vendor Show is December 7th. Uh, this is also a youth fundraiser. If you would like to have a table on that, please see Donna Tingu. And last but not least, obviously, church is in here uh, this week and next week. Um, and next week, uh, our K-5 through kids' church that's normally in the gym, we will be in the MPC over there, the two-story brick building across from the barbershop. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start in here, and after our first song, uh, when welcoming starts, we will take the kids over, um, and Glenda's pre-K class will be in one classroom. We'll, we'll decide that later on, but we will have class for our kids next week, so don't worry about that. Um, and last but not least, we have some stuff that needs to be moved in the lobby for, uh, we, we've got to put the carpet down this week, so uh, we need some strong men and young man like Jack, yes, we need you uh, to move that stuff today after church if you were able. So uh, I believe that's everything, but if you forget any of that, go to our website, tolsboroughchristian.org slash calendar. So uh, would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we have not just one, but two buildings to worship you in. Um, and we know that it doesn't even have to take place here. We know that we're a family, and wherever we unite um, together, we can worship you through our lives, through the things we do, through the things we say. Um, we know that our life is, is meant to give you worship. Um, we thank you for this family that has gathered, Lord. It's, it's awesome to see. Um, and I just pray that this morning that's what happens. We lift you up. We praise you. We build each other up as believers. Um, help us to uh, just be that family that we need to be. Um, Lord, I just pray for our service this morning as Rex comes and gives the message about unity. I pray that um, unity is what we're focused on, that we're united around you, and that we can go out in th into the community and, and share your love. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for everything that you do for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now it is time for our holy howdy. So tight space, but we can do it. Daddy. 
is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, living in the heart. I worship you. I worship you. Oh, you are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you.
Father, we thank you for each miracle that you give us. If we just look around, we can see them constantly, consistently. You give us your grace and your love. When we fall short, you pick us right back up. We thank you, Lord. Lord, I just pray that this message touches our hearts, our minds, and our hearts are open to what you have to say to us this morning. Let us learn and grow together as a church. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'll be reading from Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So then, remember this, in human terms, that is, in your flesh, you are Gentiles. You are the people who the so-called circumcision refer to as the so-called uncircumcision. Circumcision, of course, being something done by human hands to human flesh. Well, once upon a time, you were separated from the Messiah. You were detached from the community of Israel. You were foreigners to the covenants which contained the promise. There you were in the world with no hope and no God. But now in Messiah Jesus, you have been brought near in the Messiah's blood. Yes, you who used to be a long way away. He is our peace, you see. He has made the two to be one. He has pulled down the barrier, the dividing wall, that turns us into enemies of each other. He has done this in his flesh by abolishing the law with its commands and instructions. The point of doing all this was to create in him one new human being out of the two, so making peace. God was reconciling both of us to himself in a single body through the cross by killing the enmity in him. So the Messiah came and gave the good news. Peace had come. Peace, that is, for those of you who were a long way away, and peace, too, for those who were close at hand. Through him, you see, we both have access to the Father in the one spirit. This is the result. You are no longer foreigners or strangers. No, you are fellow citizens with God's holy people. You are members of God's household. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Messiah Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You too are being built up together in him into a place where God will live by the spirit. And let's all pray this verse together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So I have a special visitor here today. Um, His name's Cedric. He was my ex-boss when I went on the last two mission trips to Austria. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you a little bit about him. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cedric. I'm from Belgium. And this is my first time here in Tolsborough and at And in this church, thank you so much for your warm welcome. Um, Yeah, as Chris said, I was the chef at House Edelweiss. It's the Christian university where y'all sent her off to (laughs) over the summer. Uh, Thank you for that. She was a great help in my kitchen. Um, But now since two months, uh, God called me to become a full-time missionary for this organization called Snowboarders and Skiers for Christ. What am I doing in Kentucky? (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, indeed. (laughs) But um, I'm here to go around, visit friends, visit churches, because I need prayer. I don't know who of you have been in Europe in the last five to ten years. That's me. All right. I can say the state of the church in Europe is worrisome. I live now in Slovenia, which is a country south of Austria, and the amount of evangelical Christians is below 1%. In this country, that's about two-thirds the size of Maryland, there are nine churches for 1.8 million people. I go to the only church in my province and we are 30 people. That's why I was like, 
I want to do something about it. And God made that happen for me. So now I'm a European serving other Europeans with basically sports ministry. Could have been any could have been any sport, but I really love snowboarding. So that's that's a that's a plus. With is it still on the slide? No. Um, it was funny that it was the first of Psalms up there because our vision is to be a light on the hill. John 8, 12, Jesus is the light of the world. And we want to, with our ministry, we want to bring that light into these mountain communities. Not just ski and resort ski towns, but just any place in the mountain where there's so much darkness. Where too often people are isolated, where people feel depressed, where people struggle with alcohol abuse, drug abuse, identity crisis. And it's to those people that I want to serve. So please pray for our ministry, SFC, Snowboards and Skiers for Christ. Pray for the churches in Europe and pray that he may do the one thing that he does really well, move mountains. Thank you so much. A couple of us got to go hang out with Cedric last night, and I, I can tell you from his story, he's the real deal. Uh, you know, the, there's a concept, there's a book called The Gutter by Craig um, Gross, and the whole concept of the book is, well, all of us have a gutter we crawl out of, right? All of us had a BC time, a before Christ time, and when you finally get on your own two feet, nobody's better to go back to that gutter than you are. You know, nobody's better to go back to the world you came from before you found Jesus than you. And that, that's pretty much Cedric's story. He's it's snowboarder, skiers of Christ. You know, I was laughing at him. He's like, where's, where's the, where do you ski around here? And we're like, Indiana. <laughs> the one hill they have. Um, but like, you know, he goes back to, to, the, to where he came from, where he found Christ. You know, God reached him in there and he's going right back to it. And so uh, talk to him when you get a chance after service, if he hangs around at all. Uh, it's got an incredible story and a wonderful ministry that he's launching into. That being said, let's go ahead and jump into uh, today's message. Um, again, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, tap or turn there. Uh, it'll be on the screen as well. Um, and again, I know there's some blind spots and stuff like this, but uh, thank you all for being patient, bearing with us, you know, pardon our progress if you want to be cheesy. But like, you know, as we go through this, this process of, of finishing out our sanctuary project, it's kind of funny what makes people upset. You ever, you ever, you ever step back and just looked at, at how, what makes people mad nowadays, you know? Um, my wife made a mistake a couple years ago. She asked me to go get toilet paper. Okay, now, I know what our brand is, right? I, I know I can go get the right brand, right? And I come back, and I'm like, I did exactly what she told me. I'm going to be, you know, good me, you know, woo And uh, she looks at it, and she says, are you trying to die? I said, Why? She says, it's lavender scented. <laughs> oh. Now, if you don't know this about my wife, lavender makes her angry. If you love lavender, ride on it, but it just, it makes her angry, right? And I don't want to stand up here and be like, you know, just point her out. But like, we all have things like that, don't we? Like little things that are weird and just kind of be like, that's the thing that offends me, you know? Like for me, it's, it's, it's like people driving in the fast lane slowly, right? Uh, you know, that, that just, it bothers me to no end, you know? Uh, if, if, if somebody is late, you know, when they promised me that they would be there, and you know, things like that. We all have things that, that bother us. But at the, for the most part, those are just pet peeves, right? Those are just things that are just minor inconveniences. What I want to look at today are the things that truly make people upset, the things that, that truly get people mad. I mean, if you spend time on the Internet, like there's, a, there's entire playlists of people who are just absolutely wrecked over the seemingly most innocuous things. And you try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they had something in their past that, 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 that this touched a wound of. You know, maybe it was something serious and it, it truly is bothering them. But for the most part, you just, you can't really grasp, like, why is this person so upset about something so innocuous? It makes you scratch your head in bewilderment. How can you let a stranger or something that has no power over you have so much power 
over you. And if you think back to the moments in your life when you were truly offended, chances are it wasn't a stranger. It wasn't something you didn't care about. It was the things that you did care about. It was the people that you care about. If my wife looked at me and said, I don't love you anymore and I think you're funny looking, like that would be painful, right? But if somebody on the street just says that to me, that's like a normal Tuesday, right? Like, they don't really bother me, right? You know, if, if somebody looks at you and says, you're dumb and I can't stand you, it's like, who cares, right? But if your best friend says that to you, that, that hurts. That's the power and the danger of having people surrounding you that you care about. They have power over you because we are designed that way. We are designed to be tribal creatures, that we are designed to need people we can trust, people that we can trust to protect us and care for us and love us. See, we humans, we are built to love teams. The thing is, just like everything else in this world, the enemy can corrupt that as well. Everybody say corruption. See, corruption, that's, that's how we define sin. That's how the Bible defines sin. It's not necessarily just doing the bad thing. It's, it's anything that corrupts God's designs. And God designed us to need community, to need each other. But the enemy can corrupt that. And so when we divide ourselves up into tribes as a means to protect ourselves, to, to, to share and protect others, sometimes those tribes become really good things like families and churches other times, they're not as significant, but the pawns can be equally as strong. Uh, do I have any UK fans in the room? Nobody likes UK anymore here? See, my wife recently got a job at L, so go cards. Some of you guys don't want me to be a preacher anymore. Um, no, but like, you know, sports can unite us, right? Like, you know, uh, growing up, uh, the, we, my, my household, we were like super crazy about NASCAR. You know, my dad was a Gordon fan. We pray for him. Um, I was a Terry Labonte fan, you know. Some of you guys are Earnhardt fans, you know. And, and it gets even more ridiculous than that. You know, some guys are Chevy people. Some are Ford people. We pray for the Dodge people. Some people are Harley people. Some people are Japanese bike people. You know, it just, every, we like to tribe up. We like to find people who think like us, who act like us. And we bond together. And you can make lifelong friendships that way. You can really find community in things that don't matter as much. But as lighthearted as sports and cars and rivalries can be, sometimes we tribe up along a little bit more serious lines. And those lines aren't always bad things. You know, we, we tribe up along racial lines, ethnic lines, gender lines, sexual orientation lines, national lines, political lines, religious lines. And when you get tribal on that level, you run the risk of looking at another tribe and saying they are the bad guys. You run the risk of looking at other tribes and say they're not as good as we are. And if it goes far enough, they can become less than we are, less than human. And unfortunately, we don't have to look very hard at history, do we, to find examples of this. Probably the most famous is what Hitler did with the Jews, right? He used the Jewish people as the scapegoat for all of his problems and as a means to gain power. And in the end, millions died because all of a sudden they were the bad guys. They were less than human. You look at the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, the genocides that happened there. And it's, it's just heartbreaking, not just because of genocide, but because the Hutus and Tutsis, these two tribal societies, these people that were paired up, they were artificial. That before they killed each other, they had to look up, they had to ask, they had to research, who are you? Because you couldn't tell each other apart. It was created by the colonizers a hundred years before. Millions died. In our own country, you look at the Trail of Tears and what happened to Native American populations. You look at the Atlantic slave trade. We look at people, and if we tribe up and say, those people are not good people, they are the bad people, they are the evil people, we can easily... Make them something that we attack and destroy. And this is the pattern of humanity globally as far back as we have record. Thousands of years. See, we're continuing our series called United Divided, where we're studying the book of Ephesians. We're in week number three. We're going to be in this for nine weeks total. And Ephesians is a letter to teach the basics of Christianity. It was written by a guy named Paul. Everybody say Paul. 
And Paul was an apostle that Jesus looked at. He said, you, dude, go start churches with non-Jewish people. Go start them. And he did. And so as he went amongst his journeys, he made a lot of enemies because he was not only not liked by a lot of the Jewish people, which he used to be, still considering himself a son of Israel, but also the pagan communities, the Romans, the Greeks, he, they didn't like him either. He was upsetting their national identity. He was causing people to doubt the gods. And so he found himself in a lot of trouble. He became the bad guy a lot. As a matter of fact, when he wrote Ephesians, he was literally chained up to a Roman guard in prison. Right? That's, that was Paul's seat. That was where he was writing this letter from. And he wrote it to the churches in western Turkey. The Bible calls it Asia. That was what the Romans called it back in the day. And he wrote this letter to answer the big questions. And that's kind of like what we've been going through so far. We've been answering what are the big questions that Christians have or have had at some point in their faith journey. And today we get to the thesis. Everybody say thesis. We're going to sound smart today. Thesis. This is where he states his thesis in verses 11 through 22. See, in this section, we find the whole point of what Jesus did, right? And to understand the point, you have to understand what God had done before that. See, God launched the creation project. He created humans, us, to be like him, not to be gods, but to act like God. And the fact that we can create, we take the creation that God has made and we do cool things with it, right? And we've done a lot of cool things with it, but we've also done a lot of bad things. And because we have the capacity to do things that God did not want us to do, it broke. It corrupted creation. And so God knew he had to rescue humanity. He had to fix this. He would go in into this knowing he would have to have a plan to correct our failures, our corruptions, to rescue us from walking around as the walking dead, as things that look like we're human, but we have no life within us, as Paul said at the beginning of chapter 2. And so that plan involved finding one of us who would be faithful, he found a guy named Abraham. Remember, say Abraham. And through Abraham, he made a covenant. He said, Abraham, out of all the people on the planet, you're going to be my family. And we're going to do something great through your descendants. So he made a covenant. That's what a covenant is. That's what a marriage is. It's a covenant. It's when you look at somebody you're not related to and you say, we're going to treat each other like we're family, like we're blood. It requires blood to start a covenant. It requires blood to end a covenant. Thank goodness we don't do that weddings anymore. The thing is, God looked at Abraham and he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to make, give you family. I'm going to give you community. I'm going to give you a tribe. I'm going to make something great out of you and your descendants. And then we're going to rescue the whole world through you. And Abraham said, yes. And so Abraham grew from just him and his wife to a family, to a, tr to a people group, and eventually to a nation. The nation named after his grandson, Israel. And at that moment, when God made that covenant with Abraham, humanity used to be one big river, right? And now it's split into two. You had two branches of humanity. And so God worked through Abraham's descendants. He gave them the law. He gave them the prophets. He said, this is how you be different. The whole purpose of the Old Testament, the law, was to teach them how to be different. Act like a different river. Act like a different branch of humanity. You're not supposed to look like everybody else. You're not supposed to act like everybody else. You're supposed to be different. And he gave them the law. And then he sent prophets to explain it and show them how to live according to the law. And you'd think that with them being special, having God's special attention, being God's special people, that, that living out this covenant where God looked at them and said, you and me were family. He gave them the, the three Ps of creation. He said, you're going to be my people. You're going to live in the place I gave you, the promised land. And you're going to live in my presence. I'm going to dwell in the temple amongst you. That's where creation started. That's where it's going to end. He gave Israel a bite of that in the middle. And you'd think that they would do what he asked, worship only me, be faithful, share the message, tell the world of the rescue plan I'm doing through you and among you, that the whole world is going to be saved through you. But they failed to do that because humans, we like to tribe up. We like to insulate ourselves in our community and look at others who aren't inside our own tribe and say they're the bad guys. And that's exactly what Israel did. Despite having the law, Despite having the prophets explain the law, they kept up the same pattern as the rest of the world. As a matter of fact, that's what Jesus was so mad about when he went to the temple and started flipping tables and cracking whips. 
You know, he said, you've turned my father's house, the place where God was supposed to dwell on earth. You've turned that into a den of brigands. Everybody say brigands. Anybody know what a brigand is? A pirate. Yeah. It's a robber. He, he looked at them and he said, listen, you've stolen what was meant for everyone and kept it to yourself. You're like a postman that stole the package you paid them to deliver. No offense to postmen. We need you, right? They failed to deliver what God had given them. Jesus was so upset that he flipped tables, cracked a whip, and said, you have completely missed the mark. And after that encounter, he said, I'm tearing it down. Which is exactly what happened after Jesus went to the cross. Israel was supposed to be different. They weren't supposed to act like the rest of us. They were supposed to be a light for the rest of the world to see by a city on a hill. But instead, they robbed the world of the message that God gave them to deliver. And so after that moment, Jesus went ahead and pulled the ultimate Napoleon Bonaparte. Anybody know who Napoleon Bonaparte is? He's not a good guy. Like, he wasn't. He, he's responsible for a lot of people dying. But he's attributed, one of my favorite quotes is attributed to him. Right? You've probably heard it before. It goes like this. If you want to, a thing done well, do it yourself. Right? That was Napoleon's attitude, and that's largely why he was so successful. You want something done right, you want something done well, do it yourself. Jesus looked at Israel, looked at the job they were supposed to be doing, and he said, I'll do it. And so Israel ultimately did exactly what God had asked of them to do, to deliver this message, because Jesus was an Israelite. Like he, God fulfilled his promise to do a great thing to save the whole world through Abraham's descendants because that's what Jesus was. Jesus was the true representative of Israel. So despite their generations of failing to live out what God had asked them to do, they ultimately were successful through Jesus himself. And so with that context, we read verse 13 through 15, and it makes a lot more sense. It says, but now in Messiah Jesus, you have been brought near in the Messiah's blood. Yes, you who used to be a long way away. He is our peace, you see. He has made the two to be one. Who's the two in this? Anybody remember? We have Israel and us. The two branches of humanity. Jesus has brought them together. The two shall be one. He pulls down the barrier, the dividing wall that turns us into enemies of each other. He has done this by his flesh, by his death. By abolishing the law with its commands and instructions. The point of doing all this was to create in him one new human being out of the two, so making peace. See, Israel had failed, right? They had used the law, the thing that God gave them for everybody, as a barrier, as a dividing wall. It was supposed to be the thing that they shared with the world, but instead they used it to divide up the world. And God said, okay, we're done with that. And Jesus instituted a new law, the law of love, the law of grace. That's actually, if you read your Bible, you open it up. At the beginning, it says, old what? Old what? Testament, right? The beginning of the Bible, Old Testament. What's, what's after the Old Testament? What's the second part? The New Testament. The word testament means covenant. It's Latin for covenant, right? So the first part of your Bible is about the old law, what God did through the people of Israel. The second half is about the new covenant, the new thing that God did through Jesus, the one that we are all invited to, that Jesus tore down the barriers between us and M, and we became one, thus making peace. We have a new law, a new covenant. The old is done away with, and now we have peace. Or do we? Because the thing is, you walk around this world, you look at how many people are acting, you look at what they do with their lives, and the norm is the walking dead, is it not? That people walk around, and they kill, and they destroy, and they tear down, but the living grow, and they create. See, humanity after Jesus is now alive for the first time since the fall. You know, we talked a few weeks ago that, that, that when Jesus was walking the earth, he was the only human being walking around for a while. Sin had corrupted the rest of us and made us into the walking dead. And so we act like the walking dead. But Jesus, through what he did, brings us to life. We become the new thing. Not only just new individual that we're a new creation, but we become part of a larger group. 
where everyone is not invited. We all get to be part of God's people. We all get to live in the place he's made for us. We all get to live in his presence, the three Ps of creation. There's no room for us versus them where God is taking creation. Getting to be a few years ago, we went verse by verse through the entire book of Revelation. And in it, we get to see this played out. See, the whole point of Revelation is that empire and war and death and famine and poverty, they only exist because sin exists, because evil exists. And God is going to do something about it. That's the message of Revelation, that evil does not have an endless free reign to do what it wants, that eventually God will fix evil permanently. And at verse chapter 21, we get to see the moment that that happens. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Anytime you read in Revelation something about a sea or ocean, that represents chaos. So what he's saying by there's no longer any sea is there's no longer evil. There's no longer pain. There's no longer death. There's no longer chaos, tribalism, suffering. He says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, dressed up for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne, and this is what it said. Look, God has come to dwell with humans. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or weeping or pain anymore, since the first things have passed away. This is the vision of creation. This is the vision that we should be striving to bring about in this life. We will be unsuccessful, right? Because there's too much sin. There's too much corruption in the world around us. But Jesus gave us this picture so that we can know what to strive for. So that when we build our communities, our families, our friendships, we know what it should look like. We all still deal with corruption and sin. We all still struggle. You know, there's no illusions there. We all have to wage that war within us to make sure that the new creation, the the part that Jesus has redeemed and is redeeming, is the one making the decisions. But you know as well as I do, sometimes the other side takes the steering wheel. We're going to have conflict. But as we strive to be the community that Christ has called us to be, we strive to look like the pictures that he has given us. Where there's no more suffering, no more pain, no more dying. Where people don't turn other people into the enemy. But instead, we recognize the unity that Jesus bought for with his blood. See, we are a part of what's called the restoration movement. Everybody say restoration. If you don't know the history of that, which most people don't nowadays, it was started a couple hundred years ago by a Presbyterian minister, a Methodist minister, and a Baptist minister who were tired of the divisions within Christianity, that there was a whole lot of us versus them. And they said, listen, where the Bible speaks, we're going to speak, and where it's silent, we're going to be silent, and faith, unity, and everything else, liberty. That this entire movement, the reason this church exists is because a group of people said, listen, we want to be united. We just want to be Christians. If you want to be Calvinist, be Calvinist. You want to be Arminian, be Arminian. If you want to think different ways, you have liberty to work your way through your understanding of God. But we can't be divided anymore because that's not how it's going to be on the other side of Judgment Day. And so it's important that we recognize our call to unity, that it's important that we take ownership of this. That we don't just hold up unity as a good idea, but that we are practical and real in our application of it. That we look at our brothers and sisters, and despite our differences, we give liberty. We give grace as it's been given to us. And we love one another the way Christ loves us. That we don't be easily offended. That when you get lavender toilet paper, it doesn't make you so mad. And when somebody cuts you off on the road, you don't all of a sudden let the old person, the old creation take the steering wheel. But instead, you look at everyone with a law of love where there is no division. Doesn't mean we all have to absolutely get along. You know, that's that's not going to happen. Right. (laughs) We're going to have differences of opinion. We're human. But at the end of the day, we have to be united about what Christ has done. And that's why we have communion every single week. Number one, to prioritize what Christ has done for us, but also as a reminder of what his death bought, that it is unity. 
that his death has bought this community's ability to gather together and unite under the banner of Christ. And so if you do not have a communion cup, raise your hand and, and one of us will be happy to bring one to you. Things are different, so this, this week and next week especially, you've got to hunt for the things you normally grab when you come in the door. Everybody have one. And so we come to this moment, and we look at the juice and we look at the bread. And Jesus said, when he was gathered with his disciples, he held up a piece of bread. He said, this is my body broken for you to initiate the new covenant. Every time you eat it, remember what I have done. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. Every covenant begins with blood. Family is blood. Christ looked at you before you were made, said you are worth blood. He gave himself up for each of us so that we could be his family from now into eternity, so we can enjoy the place he's made for us directly in the presence of our God. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and remember. And so we come to a time of invitation and reflection. As always, as we sing this next song, the altar is open. If you have prayer, you want this community to pray over publicly, it's, it's, that's what this time is for. If you would like to, to, to come forward and publicly become part of our community, you don't have to do it publicly, but this time is for that. Or if you have made the decision, it's time to give my life to the Lord. If you are ready to get baptized and join the eternal community of Christ, this time is available. Baptistry still works. We'll go over there, right? We'll stand amongst all the carpet and whatever. Like, we'll make it happen. But mostly this time of invitation is for each of us to commit to the next step, to commit to what we've talked about today, what we've read today, what we've sung about today, that we are going to be the community of Christ here where we live, where we dwell. And then we're gonna let division tear us apart, but instead we are going to be united through what Christ has bought. So let's just take the next 30 seconds as, as Jake plays softly and just reflect and reprioritize. Make sure that Christ is the top of our list, the center of your world. And then we'll sing our song of invitation. If you would, bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you that despite us being unworthy, despite us being broken and flawed, corrupted and worthless, you looked at us and said you're worth something to me. That we were worth your son. And that our community was worth your son. That our love for each other is worth your son. We thank you. We praise you. We ask that you forgive us when we fail you and when we wrong you. And we lift up our broken hands to you, God, and thank you for all that you have done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, stand if you are able as we sing our song of invitation. Christ alone. My hope is found, and he is my light, my strength, and my song is cornerstone, this solid ground, and firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love.
His gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on the So now it is time for our discipleship minute where we talk about our one main job. And where's Anthony? What's our one main job? Making disciples. Making disciples. That's right. Uh, so last month, you may remember, we talked about little churches, trying to make our houses uh, little churches where discipleship happens, where we make sure the next generation uh, knows Christ. That series is over, as you can tell, but we are still here to help with that. Um, so every week... We have a Facebook page, uh, our youth Facebook page. Every week there is a, here's what we learned at church, recap, because I get it. Sometimes you'll get in the van, you'll get in the car, you'll, you'll go home and you'll say, hey, little Timmy, what'd you learn at church this week? Uh, I ate some goldfish. Uh, I understand. So we're here to help with that. So every week, uh, not only do we tell you, here's what we learned, but there are also some resources that you can use throughout the week um, at home. There's extra Bible videos. There's extra devotional material. There's extra um, discussion prompts You know, on your way to school every morning. Here, here's what you can talk about. Here's what you can do. Uh, so we're here to help as a church. So if you would like that information, if you would like those resources, um, all you have to do is scan a code right up here. And if you don't know how to do that, um, we have a lot of teenagers in the room who can help you with that. Uh, but like I said, every week, uh, every Monday morning, there is tons of resources. So we are here to help, and we're here to make sure that the next generation knows Jesus. So thank you for that. All right. Uh, we do have a couple of prayer requests. Um, before we get into them, a reminder, it is Family Sunday, in case you, you didn't notice. Uh, so that means tonight we eat. Can I get an amen? Yeah. All right. Uh, so that means in here we will have uh, tables and chairs set up. Uh, we'll play some games. Um, bring a snack, a drink, or whatever if you want to. You don't have to. Show up anyways if you, if you don't. Um, and we'll just eat and have a good time and sing happy birthday to everybody who had a birthday in the month of October. Um, and again, a reminder that uh, if you are feeling froggy and want to help move stuff in the, the, the front lobby after church today, Matt will meet you up front. Or tomorrow, yes, we are moving pews tomorrow. So if you're feeling extra froggy, like bullfrog froggy, um, tomorrow evening. Yeah, so he said uh, go Lewis County Lions because the baseball and football teams are showing up. I, I, I don't know. I saw Lewis County line. I'm uh, uh. Yeah, <laughs> but anyways, uh, so yeah, so tomorrow, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, if you want to come help, uh, even if you just want to be a cheerleader, uh, please show up. Um, so prayer requests, we do have a few. Uh, first one I'd like to mention is the Positex are in Guyana, and we already had some prayers answered. Um, again, Patty successfully smuggled stuff in that for Jesus, okay? Um, but yeah, uh, again, if you want to know what that means, ask, ask any of the million Positex running around. 
Um, continue to pray for uh, Wanda Cox, uh, Betty Hampton, uh, and two Betty's brother passed away this past week, so and she's still having back surgery as well. So uh, pray for Betty as she's going through it. Um, Derek Scott, Anna Price, uh, Judy McDaniel, um, Wanda Cox, Mike Wilson, uh, the hurricane victims, which Steve's going to share with us about that here in a second, about what we did last week. Uh, continue to pray for Raylan Poe. Pray for Avery Lawson, who is uh, physically progressing, but this poor kid spent way too much time in a hospital, so uh, pray for her that she gets to come home soon, um, and her whole family. Uh, Linda Wallingford recovering still, um, Marlene O'Call, uh, Pearl Dunnigan, uh, Eddie Meffords is at Fleming County Nursing Home still, um, Linda Breeze had uh, surgery this week, so she's recovering from that, Angie Beckett. Uh, Willinda Bailey is uh, basically going to be in Vanderbilt Hospital until she gets a new heart, so pray that that happens quickly. Um, Brenda Luca, Lucas uh, with the loss in their family, um, and James Evans as he's, he's recovering and, and struggling, and Karen Stafford. Um, are there any other prayer requests that I missed? Wally. So this, that was the prayer request that went out a, a couple nights ago, young, uh, young. I'm not sure his age is between 10 and 13 years. Between 10 and 13, uh, needing a new heart and a new liver at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. So definitely lift him up. Any others? Billy Fisher. Donna Brewer. Donnie Brewer. Dottie Brewer. I'm not 20 anymore. Uh, Zach. We were just talking about the Israelites, so uh, pray for Trump. Well, <laughs> we will pray that God's will be done, brother. Pray for our country. Again, if you haven't signed up for our prayer vigil day, please please see Mary or sign up on the list. Yeah, continue to, to pray for Diana recovering from her surgery. You let a revival Saturday or something, right? You're an animal. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, well, there you go. See, you lift up that. All right. Sue. Pray for, for Cedric and also talk to him when you get a chance. Any others? If all hearts and minds are clear, I'm going to have Steve come up and share with us about our hurricane victim relief uh, and then close us with prayer. As, and then we'll sing our song. I went up to Rex this morning. I asked him for a couple of minutes to talk about the, the the hurricane, the flood relief that's going on down in Tennessee and North Carolina. And out my heart is kind of just filled right now with gratitude and love and happiness. And I wanted to come in here today and tell you what a great church you are, what a great community we live in. Then I walked right over there in that foyer right over there. There was Tanner, 
Jake and Rex standing there. And I realized how truly blessed we are to have those three fine men here ministering to us here today. They go far beyond, just like the chairs you're sitting in today, there was not an army here that put those out there. That was Rex and Tanner. That's who put the chairs out there you're sitting in. Now, Tanner was kind of comical because he said about halfway through putting chairs out here, they realized that they wanted them in a half moon, so they got to move them again. So, But anyway, we appreciate their efforts. Friday, uh, Chuck Carlson and I went to Asheville, North Carolina, delivering the coats, the hats, and the gloves, and the blankets, buddy heaters, and propane, muck boots that people that Orangeburg Lions Club donated. And you drive down there and you're driving through Asheville and the pictures do not do it justice. It's one thing to look at something when floodwaters are going through, but it's what's left behind that is so ugly and terrible. Downtown Asheville is no more. It is a wipe slate clean. The debris still there, don't get me wrong, but it's gone when you're down there. But the people are so thankful, so thankful. And when we were delivered these items down there and we were offloading them and doing that, he told us, he says, now I'm going to take these from here and I'm going to deliver them to 14 different counties. And I'm going to take those buddy heaters to the people that are living in tents. And right then and there, I don't need to be complaining because these people went from living in a fully furnished home with everything they probably needed, maybe not wanted, and now are living in a tent. So I made a mistake when I was trying to gather items. I made one omission that I didn't realize. And think about that. I should have collected sleeping bags for those people living like that and mats to lay on. If you know anything about sleeping in a sleeping bag, if you lay on cold ground, the cold comes right through your sleeping bag. So if you even have a, a foam mattress, a mat underneath you, it'll stop the cold from penetrating up through that sleeping bag. So that'll be something that I'm going to do. People, I want to tell you, we live in a great community right here. My, my best estimations in materials and monies raised in this community area right here through our fellow churches and everyone else, it's well over $38,000 right now. That doesn't happen every day, and it doesn't happen everywhere, I can promise you, because I'm the council chair for the state of Kentucky, and no other community has done that. Yes, they're doing things, but not that level, not that extent. Thank you all for your generosity. Thank you for your love. That being said, let us pray. Our Lord and God, we come to you in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful to be part of this community, part of this church. Lord, we are thankful for our ministers here who love us so very much, and we love them. They touch our hearts. They inspire us. They lead us, and we are so fortunate to have them. Lord, we think about those that couldn't be here today, whether it be sickness or otherwise. They're part of our family, and we miss them, dear Lord. And we pray that they be back here with us soon. And for all those answered prayers, dear Lord, we thank you. You touch our hearts in special ways. You forgive us of our sins. You give us so very much, much more than we deserve. You gave Jesus on the cross. What more could we possibly ask for? Lord, we love you and we praise you. For this we do pray in Jesus' holy and blessed name. Amen.